All right, amen. Joel chapter 3. I want you to look at verse number 14. Joel 3, look at verse 14. It says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, the title of my sermon this morning is Better Decisions Equals Better Memories. And the whole point of this sermon is to help us make better decisions in life so that we don't live a life full of regret and remorse, right? I think everybody in here can relate to that, and everybody in here wants that and would like that to be uh, a, a thing in their lives. Now, the reason why I picked this verse here is because the word decision is only brought up this time here in the Bible. But yet the concept of decision making and choosing wisely and these things, I mean, it, there's a lot to unpack with it, more than we have time to go over uh, this morning. However, just to give you a little bit of context, so the book of Joel, uh, it, it's, it's a book that people often will go to to, you know, insinuate controversy and things like that. Uh, people will go here to try to prove the pre-tribulation rapture. You know, unfortunately, we don't have time to, to get into that. But basically, it's a book where the prophet is comparing and he's contrasting what's going on in his day in the southern kingdom of Judah versus the end times here. And in verse 14, God, you know, well, the context is set in verse 2, where the heathen nations have gathered themselves together in this valley to basically make war against God. I mean, just think about that decision for a second. Think about how things are going today and the decisions that people are making today on how to live their lives, what to think, what to believe. You know, people are making decisions right now to be completely uh, just, just sorcerized by the media and believe whatever they say. And that decision is going to cost most people, unfortunately, their eternity. Because the media hates God. If you didn't know that, the media absolutely hates God. And that's one of the vehicles that I believe the devil is using to prepare for this day and time here. Now, in verse 14, it says, multitudes, multitude in the valley of decision. So these people that are in this valley, they've already made a decision that, you know what? We don't need God. We can defeat him. Our leader will beat him. We don't need his ways. We don't need his statutes. We don't need his testimonies. We can do this on our own. And God is basically saying, hey, I'm here to actually render the decision. Which, by the way, the definition of decision is judgment. Right. Think about that. If you type it into your, your dictionary app, one of the words that's going to come up is judgment. A decision is a determination after consideration. And what are we being taught today? Well, it's wrong to judge. Right. Don't judge. You're being hateful if you judge. Right? You all heard about the firebombing that took place at First Works, uh, I'm sorry, First Works Baptist Church in El Monte, California. Now, there's a lot to be said about that, right? What happens if I preach a sermon today called, uh, I don't know, Leviticus 2013, you know, the government should execute queers. Well, there's going to be people that come up and say, well, that's a hate crime, <laughs> you know? But yet the media is not calling what happened at El Monte uh, at First Works Baptist Church a hate crime. Right. Why is that? You see, they've made a decision a long time ago to hate God and to try to sway the masses and prepare for this day. But you know what? Those people in that valley and people like them throughout the entire world are going to live an eternity with nothing but regret. Their memories will not be happy. They will not be pleasant. They're going to be rendered with regret. And so that's what it's saying there. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So this is the final day here where God's like, okay, You've made your choice. You've rendered your decision, your judgment, even though you say don't judge, don't hate. <laughs> we all know that's a lie. God's saying, guess what? Today, the clock's up. You're done, and now you're going to have to spend eternity in hell. Now, obviously, we're all you know, saved in here, hopefully. This is a, a body of believers, and we're always in the valley of decisions. I mean, the reason why you're here this morning is because you made a decision. You know, so you need to kind of trace back to that because I'm sure not everybody in here woke up and was like, wow, you know, I'm refreshed. I, I'm so excited to go to church, right? If some days are like that, but not always. You know, sometimes a lot, in fact, a lot of times you're going to see doing the right thing and making the right decision is often uh, a, a difficult choice. And I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, the reason why I'm standing here today is because of the decision that I made in my life. And one of the best ones, and Jessica will agree with this, you know, is the fact that I married her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that led to the way that our children act. Uh, and it, it helped me to be here for you this morning. Because let's face it, you know, the Bible talks about the qualifications of a bishop or of a pastor. Well, the wife plays a huge role in that. You know, and not every woman can do that. Let's just be honest. You know, because the minute you decide you want to stand up and be in ministry, whether it's a pastor, a deacon, an evangelist, you, I mean, I mean, heck, even if every one of you, if you really think about it, you have a target on your back. And I have a target on my back, you know, and it takes a it takes a certain type of person to say, you know what, I can deal with that. 
You know, because it's hard when you hear things, right? Because let, let's face it, she's got a target on her back. You know, and, and every once in a while we'll hear somebody saying something about, you know, about her or about the kids or about me. But yet there's not enough witnesses to actually confront somebody. That's difficult to deal with. When you know somebody's talking trash, but you can't prove it. You know, that's hard to deal with. But that's the life that we chose. That's ministry. And when you really think about it, that happens to all of you. Because all of you have made a decision. You know what? I'm going to go to a church that's going to preach the truth, which is extremely, <laughs> extremely the opposite direction of what the world believes and what the world's pushing. You know, just stepping through that door is taking a huge risk if you really think about it because your family more than likely does not agree with the Bible. They would rather go to the church with the lights and the worship band that never talks about anything controversial, that never is going to really help you in life. Well, you know what? If you're going to be a disciple for Christ, guess what? That means at some point you're going to have to take a stand. That means at some point you're going to have to realize, you know what? The opinions and the views that I hold are contrary to the world, and it's going to cost me relationships. It's going to cost me money, possibly. It's going to cost me pain. But I'm telling you right now, better decisions equals better memories. And if you just pay attention to what I have for you this morning, I promise you it's going to help you make better decisions in your life. And I'm just going to say this right off the bat. None of us are going to make the right decision all the time, right? We're always in the valley. There's always decisions that we have to make. There's always a steep wall on either side of us. And you know what? From time to time, we're going to make these bad choices, right? But the better that you get at making the better choices with the smaller decisions that you're faced with every single day, the better that you will get when that big decision is in front of you. Okay. So I just wanted to say that. Now turn to Proverbs chapter number 14, Proverbs chapter number 14. You know, it just takes one wrong decision to ruin your life, cost you your wife, your husband, your children, your relationships, your job. It takes one bad decision and it's all done. And guess what? Now you're living with the pain of remorse, the pain of regret. And that's what we're trying to minimize. That is what we do not want as God's people. Because when you get into that position, then guess what? Everything for God kind of goes on the back burner because now you got all this mess to straighten out in your life. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't help any of us out when that happens. And, you know, if you really think about it, you know, this, these people, whoever they were, probably fags that firebombed First Works Baptist Church. Think about what's going to happen when they get caught. Despite what the media wants to say and they want to push and they want to believe, they still are going to have to pay the price, which is going to be prison. You know, and more than likely, those people have already made up their minds that they would like to be inside this valley someday because they hate God. You know, so that's a double whammy. You know, make the decision to hate God to whether, you know, he just gives you over to a reprobate mind. And then now you just live a life of just animalistic instincts, right? Promoting peace. Oh, we need to keep El Monte friendly, right? We need to keep it friendly. So we'll just blow up people. We'll just blow up someone's building. You know, they have bills to pay. They have musical equipment, camera equipment. You know, this, this stuff is not cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But these fags don't seem to care about stuff like right. that, do they? Proverbs chapter 14, look at verse number 12. It says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Right. And what you have to understand is that the way that it's talking about, there's a certain pattern that is always flowing throughout the world, right? We talked about this recently, the course of this world. Who is in charge of pushing and altering and influencing that course or that pattern? It's the devil, it's Satan, okay? And it says here, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. And that pattern that flows throughout the world, most people look at that and say, that is right, that is correct, right? Most people that I run into on a daily basis, they think, that getting that vaccine that has just come out is the way to go, that that's right. But what are we starting to see right now? It's the way of death. But you see, to the worldly person, you know, it's always, oh, it's, it's the easy option, right? I just stick a needle and everything will go back to being normal. Just pop a needle in my arm full of, you know, aborted fetal cells and toxic chemicals. And all of a sudden, you know, my life's going to get better. It seems right. This is what CNN says. This is what MSNBC says. I mean, even Trump's pushing it. Both sides are pushing it. It's got to be right. But guess what? The end thereof are the ways of death. Right. And people are making this decision every single day. And that's just one thing. Right. Think about creepy Joe Biden. Yeah, right. 
signing all these executive orders. Mike sent me an article, you know, and, and I was reading it this morning. And I was like, wow, this is like perfect for my sermon, you know, because this guy wakes up and signs all this crap and can't even probably read. Do you really, I mean, do you really think this dude's reading all these executive orders, which are probably hundreds of pages when it's all tallied up? No, he's literally just waking up, just rule whatever. As long as it's left wing and commie, I'll sign it all day long. He's literally he makes a decision every single day that is affecting the lives of every single person in this country. You know what? And, and, and that just goes to show you decisions that people make. I mean, they don't just affect us. So it affects a lot of other people most of the time. So he says that there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, there's a way that most people agree regarding salvation. Most people think, okay, as long as my good outweighs my bad, God will forgive me because he's a loving God and he loves everybody and everything all the time, no matter what. But what's the end result of that decision? Death. That's right. See what I mean? Death. And it's like that with so many things in life. And so here's the point that I want to make this morning. The right decisions are often the hardest of your options. Because let's think about this. Let's just take the vaccine, for example. You know, the, a lot of people are starting to talk, well, you, you may not be able to fly. You may not be able to work here. You may not be able to go here. You may not be able to go to the NFL. I read another article. I don't know if one of you guys sent it to me uh, about the, NF the NFL saying, well, we're going to give all these free tickets to people who can prove that they've gotten the vaccine so that they can come and, and watch these football games. <laughs> you know, and, and, and people are like, wow, this is, this is great. Yes, yes, yes. But again, you know, that's the easy route. The hard route is to, to listen to that person that says, you know what? Do you really think that you can gain health by injecting yourself with toxic chemicals, with this potion of death? You know, it's hard to go against the grain, right? It's harder to swim upstream. And I'm not saying that every decision that you're faced with, you need to find the hardest route because that's stupid. But more often than not, it's the thing that's the hardest that's often the right decision. Right? Because it's easy to just go with the flow. It's easy to just placate people and say, you know what? I'll take the vaccine. That way my boss will be happy and, and, and they'll love me. Right? And, and they'll be like, oh, good boy. But you might just wind up like this in a casket for the rest of your life. Or, you know, it, it's game over. It's easy to just say, you know what? I think that some works are involved. That pleases everyone. That pleases the heathen. Yeah. It, it really does. Because when you talk to the atheist or you talk to the heathen, you know, if they're willing to talk to you out solely, guess what? They're going to tell you, I think as long as you just love your fellow man, everything will be fine. And if there is, right, they, look, that is what they believe. And it's no different than the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, or any Christian church that's out there just about. Right. It is always harder to go upstream. And so all I'm trying to tell you is that when you're faced with decisions, when you're in that valley and you're looking to your left and you're looking up to your right, you know, consider the harder option. That's all I'm trying to tell you, because more often than not, that's going to be the way to go. I mean, think about it. You get two hours of sleep last night. That alarm clock goes off. It's easy to have this conversation with yourself. There's a Sunday evening service. <laughs> There's a Wednesday service. There's lots of Sundays coming up. And then just turn that alarm clock off and sleep through service. It's easy to fall into that pattern, but it's hard to get the discipline to say, you know what, I'm just going to get up and I'm just going to go through it. But here's the thing, and you all know this, whether you got one hour, two hour, or four hours of sleep last night, at the end of this service, I believe truly that you're going to be glad that you came, regardless. Even if you sleep through what I'm saying, <laughs> you know what I mean? At least you saw somebody's smiling face, or you're going to talk with somebody, you're going to be blessed by somebody or something that happens here this morning. You made the right decision, and that was the harder of your options that you had. And that's just a silly kind of example, but I think it's one that we all go through often. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. And here's another example. What's harder, to save money or to spend money? <laughs> we all know the answer to that. It's harder to save than it is to spend. I can spend money all day long, but saving it, it's like, man, well, if I save it, it's going to lose its value. You know, we're going to go to this one world currency. I might as well just spend it all anyways, right? I mean, what's the difference? Who cares? You know, until something breaks uh, and you need a large sum of money quickly, right? I see this 
it happened all the time because I, I'm in the appliance repair business. So, you know, I go to people's houses and they're like, well, I just don't have the money for that. I'm like, you got a five car garage. <laughs> You've got like a, a boat that's bigger than our church building <laughs> and there's no ocean here. So, <laughs> Um, how do you not have the money for a $200 repair? <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy, but it happens all the time. Yeah. You know, it's because these people just live in the moment because that's what's easy to do. First Corinthians nine, look at verse number 27. This is what Paul said about this subject here. First Corinthians nine, look at verse number 27. He says this, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a castaway. And so what Paul's saying there is, hey, we are better off to consider these harder options. Discipline is what he's talking about here. You know, and so when you're faced with a decision and you're like, you know what, what, what am I going to do here? It's good for us to sometimes just stop and think, okay, well, what's the harder route? And then consider that. And then as we go through the rest of the sermon, I'm going to give you some tips. I'm going to give you some questions and things to go along with that to help you make the right decision. Because other times, you know, it's, it's, it's the easy decision, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's correct. But that's oftentimes more in the minority of what we're talking about. Now turn to 1 Kings chapter number 20. 1 Kings chapter number 20. So the right decisions are more often than not the hardest of your options in life. You know, taking the hard road. So 1 Kings chapter number 20. We talked about this chapter uh, a couple Wednesdays ago. So I don't want to get too deeply involved in it. But when I was studying that out, I, I wrote this down because who better to go to for examples regarding decision making than a king? You know, and this, you guys are, are probably familiar with this chapter here. 1 Kings chapter 20 is about Ahab. And in the beginning of the, the passage here, it's Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, basically saying, hey, look, I'm coming to take everything that you have. But what I want to do is I want to analyze Ahab's decision-making skills here because we can learn a great deal from Ahab. I mean, look, there's a reason why there's a lot in the Bible about Ahab. It's so that we as kings and priests don't make these same mistakes and make these same decisions here. So real quickly, look at verse number two. It says this, and he, remember this is Ben-Hadad, and he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city and said unto him, thus saith Ben-Hadad. Verse three, thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also, and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. So what do we have going on here? Well, we have a challenge issued to Ahab by this king, by this tough guy, Ben-Hadad. And so now Ahab has a decision to make. And like I said earlier, you know, <laughs> The right decisions, more often than not, are the hardest ones. This is kind of like the except this, this should be an easy decision here. Okay? Now, to, to us who are normal, it would be hard for you to give up your wives, your children, your family to some heathen king. I mean, I think we can all agree on that. That would be the hard decision. But for Ahab here, it's the easy one. Right? Because it's often more easy. It's easier to not have to fight. Right? It's easy not to have to fight. I mean, think about it. You walk up to someone's door and it says no soliciting. Now, I don't, I don't harass people and say, you know, you're weak if you don't knock that door. Some people knock them, some people don't. If it's handwritten, often I won't do it because you just kind of know people's attitudes, you know. They took the time to think about writing that there, and we, we know what they mean most of the time, yeah. right? But I do more, when it's just a placard, a lot of times I'll knock it, especially if it's on an apartment because you don't know if the person that's leasing that apartment has actually put that sign on there. Right. And one time we got five people saved in an apartment that said no soliciting, no religion, no whatever. So you never know. Okay, but you know when you see that, you're faced with a decision, and you know the possibility of conflict exists. And it's easier, honestly, to just walk away, right? Now, that's kind of a mild example here, but that's what Ahab's faced with. You know, it's easier in this situation here for Ahab to say, you know, I just don't want to fight. I don't want any war, and I'll just give you my family. I'll give you my money. It, 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 it's all good. Now, look at verse number four. And the king of Israel answered and said, my Lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. So here's the first decision that he makes. And you know what? Anytime you try to placate the world, especially a bunch of faggots, guess what? It's never good enough. You know, and I'm not saying Ben-Hadad's a faggot, but he's obviously implacable here because look at verse 5. 
And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that, and this here is what gets him, that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put in their hand and take it away. And so now Ahab is faced with another decision that he has to make. Okay, look at verse 7. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. And all the elders of the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Turn to Luke chapter 12. And here's the second point that I want to make. Choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. You see, again, like I said before, you know, when you're considering your options here, you have a decision to make. More often than not, it's going to be what's harder that is the right thing to do. Whether it's harder emotionally, harder financially, or harder physically. I mean, think about it. If you have a goal to, to, to lose fat, everybody says, oh, I want to lose weight. Nobody wants to lose weight. Very few people, unless you're in the mixed martial arts business or some kind of athlete, right? Most people don't want to just lose general weight. You want to lose fat so that you don't look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Let's just be honest. Right? Well, guess what? You're faced with an option. You can either work extremely hard and be disciplined, or you can take the easy route and buy all these programs that will promise you the moon. And, and the choice is yours. And you know which one pays off. Right? Where do you think the saying, no pain, no gain, came from? You know, it came from the Bible. That's wisdom in the Bible. Okay? And Ahab here, his first deci the decision that he makes is the easy one, the one that neglects conflict. Because it's hard for us sometimes to get people upset. But you know what? When we can muster up discipline in our lives and say, you know what? I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. You know what? That's when you're going to live a life without regrets. I mean, seriously, do you really want to get to the end of your life and realize that all the people that you tried to placate, all the people that you tried to please, and they don't give you any return? I mean, I mean think about that. Do you want to get to the end of your life and realize, you know what? All those people I try to placate and please, they never really cared about me. They just try to take more and more and more from me. Right. And you live the life of a chump. Yep. You're not going to have the best memories. I, you, and you say, well, I'm saved. Yeah, that's true. But it's not like God's going to wipe your memory completely clean. I don't, I don't believe that. I think you're going to go into heaven and be like, man, I could have done so much more if I wasn't such a compromiser. Yep. So all I'm trying to tell you is point number two is decide to choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. Luke chapter 12, here's an example of this. Look at verse 13. I, I, I love this one here. It says, And one of the company said unto him, this is Jesus, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus was always dealing with stuff like this, where people would come up to him and try to pull him into unnecessary drama. I'm not against drama, I'm against unnecessary drama. I'm against fighting the right things, the things that matter. And so is Jesus. Look at verse 14. And he said unto him, and this is the only time in the Gospels that you see this phrase here, and, and which is why I put it in here, because I think it's very, very applicable to what we're talking about. It says this. And he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Right? So think about this. Jesus has been doing miracles, preaching the kingdom, training people, doing all of this stuff. And here a guy comes up to him, and he's like, master, you know, tell my brother, you know, he's being weak. He, he won't share. <laughs> right? And so Jesus is faced with a decision because that he knows all of the disciples and everybody who is around him, they're going to react. They're going to act based on how he handles this challenge here. But what does he say? Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And then he tells you why he says that in verse 15. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Now think about that. He decided to show us an example of discipline here, right? Because oftentimes when people come up to us, we're tempted to be like, okay, I'm going to help you, I, right? People come up to you with, with all sorts of stuff. And you just instinct, instinctively, you, you want to help them because you're a Christian. You study the Bible. You've got this knowledge, right? And you just want to just pour it out there. Just, just give them all this counsel. But you got to be careful with that because a lot of times people are doing that 
maybe even unknowingly, they're doing that to rope you into a battle that you don't belong into. And Jesus is like, why am I going, why am I going to facilitate what's inside your heart right now, which is covetousness. Why am I going to get involved in that? And so he decides, you know what? I'm just going to shut this down right now. You don't owe anybody anything. You don't owe everybody in your family, everybody in your workplace, an answer about their stupid problems. And a lot of times people will come up to me because they know I'm a pastor and they'll, 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 they'll do this. Well, hey, you know, my husband does this. My wife does this. And, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, and I'll just sidestep them. Because for one, it's like you don't believe the Bible, yeah. right? And so why am I going to give you counsel? And, and look, I'm not against counseling people, but one thing that I've learned in my short time in ministry is I don't give people the answers anymore. Because I've already tried that, and people, you know what they do? Thanks. <laughs> right? And then they don't do what I said, and they still blame me anyways. Yeah. What you said didn't work. So now what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just ask questions and try to hint, leave little breadcrumbs to what I want them to do. And then just walk away. Because now you can't blame me. And I counseled you and I helped you out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, it's just the way it is. But I, I just think it, it, it's interesting here how he says, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Sometimes we need to stop and suppress that desire to just want to help everybody out in every situation. Because it's distracting. But you know what? It takes discipline, doesn't it? Because look, there's people that you care about. Right? There's people that you love. And they're going to come up to you. And they're going to try to pull you into things that you shouldn't be involved in. And it takes discipline. It takes discipline to make the right decision. Amen. And you have to tell them, you know what? I don't need to get involved in this. Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? Now, you can do this tactfully. You don't have to be rude all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Turn back to 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings 20. And, you know, he was always going through this. I mean, the, 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 the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they're always coming up to him and trying to bait him into, in, in, into some sort of, argue, you know, get some sort of a debate or, or, or to, to ensnare him in his words. And so Jesus is always making the right decision. And so we need to realize that and study these things out. And sometimes you need to tell people, hey, who made me a judge over you? You know, sometimes I tell that to the kids, you know, especially when they were younger. They'd be fighting over a toy or something. It's like, get out of here. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to spend the time to do an investigation on who took the red truck, you know? <laughs> it's ridiculous. So we already looked at the first decision in depth that Ahab made. He said, you know what? Right now, it's easier for me to just take the easy road and just placate Ben Haddad. That way, I don't have to fight. But you know what? If he would have done that, he would have had a life of regret. I mean, he already had a life of regret anyways. But he really, I think what he would have been saying is, if I had only. I think those are the worst words that you could wake up to every day, if I had only. And we all have them. We all have them. Everybody in here, and you know, you have thoughts from day to day, or from week to week, at times, if I had only, if I had only saved a little bit of money, if I had only said no, if I had only said, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you, if I had only considered, if I had only done what was harder, right, then this would have happened. And Ahab in this situation here, I believe he would have spent the rest of his life he would have given up everything to Ben Haddad, saying, if I had only. Those are the words that we absolutely positively want to minimize in our lives, if I had only. And if you have those, which you all do, we all do, it's okay. The past is the past. Time's moving forward. The idea, the goal is to not have as many of those as we move on, okay? And so I want to show you here how Ahab makes his second decision. So again, look at verse number seven. Right? So he's faced with this other challenge. Ben Haddad's implacable. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to follow you around. Uh, and not only you, but I'm going to follow your servants around. And I'm going to find out that everything that you like, oh, you like this stuff here? Well, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take, you know, take your pulpit. I'm, I'm just going to take everything. I'll, I'm going to take the hymns off the wall. You know, whatever is pleasant in your sight, I'm taking all of that. Right? He's kind of like the, the, the federal government. Yeah. It's kind of like Joe Biden that, the, and Kamala Harris. That's what they want to do. Oh, you like the King James Bible? Well, guess what? We're going to label it hate speech. <laughs> Oh, you like Solon? And guess what? Well, we're going to, you know, say you can't do that because you're spreading germs. <laughs> There's always something like that going on. But look what he decides to do in desperation here. And keep in mind, he is a king. Verse 7. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief, for he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. Now, I... <laughs> 
<laughs> I hope, hopefully anybody in here would have been like, I'm just going to conceal that matter. Just not talk about it here. <laughs> but God's like, no, I'm going to manifest that so the people can learn. Verse 8. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, hearken not unto him, nor consent. Now here's what Ahab does to lead him to making the right decision. Because if you haven't read the rest of the chapter, we're not going to. I'll just tell you what happens. God rewards him for this decision here. And he actually helps him beat the Syrians in two separate battles. Okay. And so he's actually right here to go to the elders and guess what? Ask questions. He actually gets help. And so here's the application here. Good questions lead to better decisions. You say, I want to make better decisions from now on for the rest of my life. Well, I'm going to tell you something here. You need to ask good questions. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 13 real quick. Proverbs chapter number 13. You know, I had a pastor that used to always say, hey, it's always better to act than it is to react. The idea is somebody cuts you off in traffic. The finger doesn't just automatically go up. You consider your actions before you do that. I used to ride home from work. I, I was uh, doing some work in San Diego uh, on uh, North Island, and I was in a carpool. And every day I'd ride home with this guy, and his goal was to get flipped off every day. I'm, I'm serious. I am dead serious. This was his goal. He's like, the, I want to get flipped off at least once every single day, right? And he would always drive, and this dude was a maniac, you know? And I didn't have enough, you know, I had to ride with him. It was just, just the, kind of the way things were. And he, he hit that goal every day. It is not hard to get the finger, but it just kind of brought this back to my memory. Like, you know what? Most people, honestly, and, and we've all been there, <laughs> don't even lie. <laughs> we've all been there. You know, most people just react, you know? So what he would do is he would get in front of somebody like in a big truck and just boom, just cut them off or brake check them real quick until they got next to him. And actually he, I'm talking, he wanted finger out the window. That is what he wanted. And that's what he got. He just loved this. Like, like he had this, this, this little bit of wisdom here figured out, you know? And, and, and the ironic thing is here is that he went to the same Baptist church that I got saved in as a kid. So I think he heard this, but he just kind of like turned it around for evil. You know what I mean? It's just, it's crazy, right? But it just kind of, it kind of brought to my attention, you know, most people really do. We, it's human nature. We do just react instead of thinking about it, you know? And every once in a while he cut somebody off and they would just, you know, like whatever. And I, he, he, it would bother him because he realized, I just ran into somebody who's got some consideration, who's got some discipline. Right? Who took the harder route to suppress that anger and those emotions and say, you know what? I'm not going to lash out. I'm not going to just react. You know, and Jessica has always reminded me of this. You know, you, you know, you're supposed to, you're a pastor. You're supposed to act, not react. Right? <laughs> Skull's laughing. <laughs> yeah. Possibly because of yesterday, but that's a story for another day, right? <laughs> Anyways, Proverbs 13, 20, right? So good questions lead to better decisions. Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So Ahab decides to go to the elders, the people who actually have a bit of wisdom, right? They've seen kings come. They've seen kings go. They understand how things are going in the southern kingdom of Judah because they, by and large, don't have wicked kings. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go up to them, and I'm going to put this matter to them, which obviously took some humility. And sometimes that's what, you know, we need to realize. It's a, hum it's a humbling thing, and it takes discipline to say, you know what? I don't really have it figured out. I need help especially being a king. And you know what? Going to this church, you know, for X amount of time, you know, we preach the Bible, you know, there, there's, there's some, that's definitely something to be proud of. But that doesn't mean that from time to time, you don't need to go to somebody and get some counsel and get some help. And what the Bible's telling us here, hey, if you walk with wise men, then guess what? You're going to be wise. Which tells us what? We need to have the discipline to cut these fools out of our lives. You know, it, it's just the way that it is. Now, obviously, you guys that work with a bunch of bozos, it's not a whole lot you can do about that. But the, the difference is you're not going to them for counsel about matters of the world or of the Bible. Now, sometimes you have to go to them to help, you know, do your trade. That's, that's different, right? That, that, that's okay. That, that's fine. That's okay. That's not what I'm talking about here. But it says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So why go walk with wise men? Because you can ask them questions because they've lived, they've got experience, they've got knowledge that they can help pass on to you. The Bible says there is safety in the multitude of counselors. So when you just huddle up and you think, you know what, I've got it all figured out. I don't, I don't, I don't need anybody else. Guess what? That's a foolish thing, the Bible says, and that's what's going to cause you to fall. And what does it say about the fool? It says, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You know what? Joe Biden's going to get destroyed. Yep. 
Kamala Harris is going to get destroyed. That person who firebombed First Word uh, Baptist Church, guess what? They're going to be destroyed. God's not going to let those things go unpunished. And, you know, I was just kind of doing some reading on some of the people that Biden has picked. And these people are absolutely, positively, straight up monsters. Monsters. People that actually hate humanity. That want people to literally die. And they think this is a good thing. He picked somebody. Who, I, what was that, Emmanuel, that, what was that guy's name? Uh, Yon, uh, Rom Emmanuel, right? Did he pick him or was it his brother? He picked both of these guys. And these people think that it's a good thing to die after, what, 75 years old? Dude, that's crazy. That's insane. You know, there's people that are 75 years old. They can run marathons. They can speak very clearly. You know, when I was in Sacramento, I got a guy who was 84 years old saved. And this guy coaches football for little kids. <laughs> Think about that for a second. And you want to tell me that we just need to cut all the elderly off? That's wicked. That's wicked as hell. So good questions lead to better decisions. So here's some questions. I'm just going to give you three just, just real basic questions. You already know them, but sometimes it just helps to be faced with this, to be reminded of these things so that you can make better decisions. All right? Because remember, it is better to act than it is to react, and that is a struggle, and that takes discipline. And so number one is, okay, you're faced with, you're faced with a decision. You're in this valley. What does the Bible say? Now, the world in, in, in our flesh wants to say, you know what? Ah. <sighs> I don't know, man. Just, 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 just hold up, right? Just, just, just get that Bible thing out of the way. Because guess what? The Bible's more than likely going to give you what's harder. Yeah. What did Jesus say? Hey, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Yeah. Guess what? That involves conflict. That involves fighting. That involves battle. That involves discipline and hard work. And you know what? That's the hard route. But you know what? That's the route that's going to cause you to live a life with fewer regrets. I'd rather get to the end of my life and say, you know what? I'm glad that I was instant in season and out of season. I just didn't care what people thought. Look, if I cared what other people thought, I wouldn't be standing up here today. I wouldn't be yelling and screaming and acting the way that I do. <laughs> you know, this, this is who I am. This is me. And you all know that. And I'm not up here with some facade. I don't get up here and say, well, you know, I'm better than you. I've got all kinds of problems. I make mistakes all the time. I'm human. We all do. But the deal is, can you muster up some discipline? Can you learn to just say, you know what, the harder thing to do in decision making is to see what the Bible says about these things. Because you know what? It's uh, more often than not, it's going to get people mad. It's going to get people upset. It could cause a bomb to go off in your church building. Yeah. It could cause 500 fags to stand outside of your front door at, at your church. Yeah. But that's the right decision to make. And you know what? Those people, you know Pastor Menace, he has no regrets for any sermon that he's ever preached or any stand that he's ever took. And I guarantee you that Pastor Mia, Pastor Mia, he has no regrets of anything that he said because it comes from the Bible. And he asked himself this question one day, what does the Bible say about this issue? I'd much rather please God than man. Now, question number two is, what do the wise say? This is why it's so important to come to church, because there are wise people in church. If you go to the church, it preaches the Bible, hopefully, right? <laughs> but, but think about this. You come to a place like this and you're stuck. You have a problem. You can go and seek out what people have gone through, what people say. And you know what? They're going to talk you through it, just like Ahab did. You know, it doesn't say that those elders were saved. It doesn't say much about them. But they gave him the right answer because they've lived a life of battle. They've seen things go down. And you know what? There is value to be found in that. And we need to realize that. And so the second question you need to ask is, what do the wise think? And this requires action. This requires you humbling yourself, getting the discipline, and actually going to somebody and saying, hey, I need help. You know what? Because we don't all have it figured out. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 35 years. I don't care if you've read the Bible 30 times. You will find yourself in the valley of decision, I promise you. And you're going to need help. We all do because we're human. And number three is how does this affect the future? How does this affect the future? You know, I think that if we could all just get this one question into our heads, we would live a life void of many regrets and remorse. Right? Because let's think about it. The worst words that you could possibly have playing in your head every day is, if I had only. If I had only done this. If I had only considered other people. If I had only considered the future. So what does the future hold? How is the decision that I want to make or that I'm leaning towards going to affect the future? 
If you can ask yourself these three questions here, and obviously there's others, like I said, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to decision making. It's impossible to get it into one sermon, which is why, you know, you'll see me preach this again in like four months, but in a different angle, because there's just so much that goes into this. But if you just ask, what does the Bible say? What do the wise say? And how does this affect the future? You know what? You're going to make better decisions. There's no way you're not going to. And good decision, or I'm sorry, good questions lead to better decisions, which lead to guess what? Better memories, because that's the goal. That's how we find peace, right? We are supposed to make peace as people. And you can make peace with other people. You can make peace with yourself when you remain disciplined and you make the right choice, even if it's going to hurt other people. Because guess what? When we preach against the queers, it hurts other people. But you know what? Those people are dogs. Those people are fags. Those people can't be placated. So why am I going to even try? Every single church in this valley that allows faggots inside of their church, you want to know something? They all have molestation. 100%. 100%. Undeniable. And those people that firebombed Pastor Mejia's church, you know what? All they're doing is proving Genesis 19, Judges 19, 1 Kings 15 with Asa, you know, saying, hey, where God said, hey, it was a good thing that he got rid of that idolatry and the sodomites. Amen. Jude, I mean, the, the, the whole Bible, Romans chapter 1, yeah. right? It, 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 they're implacable. This is what they do. They are about death and destruction. That's it. Yep. You just need to realize, you see the word sodomite, you see two queers holding hands, death and destruction. Yep. They are, that's what they promote. That is what they seek after, yep. to cause death and destruction, yep. to molest people, to violate people. That is what they do. That is all they can do. And you know what? It's the government's fault. It is the government's fault because the government is not supposed to allow that to happen. That's right. Obviously, I'm not going to take the law into my own hands and go do anything. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. It's not what God wants. We have to remain wise in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And you know what? We're going to do that by making the right decisions. And somebody yesterday, I, I wasn't going to say it, but I'll just say it because you all want to know anyways. You know, Skulk and I, we knocked on this guy's door. And he didn't, he didn't want to talk, which is fine. All right, so he opens the door. He's like, he, he does this lip curl, right? He's like, slams the door. Okay, no problem. No problem at all. Right, but then he opens the door. <laughs> it, 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 and I, I told you guys on Thursday, this, this is bad, right? <laughs> it's almost like when people do that, it's almost like you can go five, four, three. There's the door, right? You see, Moses, he's laughing because he knows. This is what happens sometimes. You know, and this guy opens the door, and he's like, hey, in case you can't read, <laughs> Right. In case you can't read, there's no soliciting here. I said, hey, in case you didn't know, we're just visiting. You know, and he's like, no, you're soliciting. I was like, no, we're not soliciting. You need to learn your definitions. Yeah. And that's a true statement. And guess what? He almost made a decision that he's about to regret because he charged us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, he started, seriously, I, I, Craig, he, he started doing that. He did the Conor McGregor. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And, and, and then he stopped, right? And he made the right decision. And so I'm going to call the cops on you. And we're like, please do, because you're going to go to you. You were going to try to attack us. Yeah. You wanted to fight us. Yeah. <laughs> we were walking away and you tried to, to bomb rush us. <laughs> so, you see, that's 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 somebody who decided, you know what? I'm just going to react. Yeah. You know, he probably thought, oh, well, these religious people here, they're extremely weak. I'll just pick on them. You know, I'll just beat I'll just beat on them. And we did wind up leaving because. The, like, who was it? it was, uh, oh, yeah, uh, Anthony and David, they knocked the door. Kind of a similar situation. You know, the, 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 do- the door that Skulk knocked before we knocked this guy's door, you know, same situation. I figured, let's just get out of here. We're just going to shake the dust off early <laughs> and, and just leave here because this is just garbage here. But anyways, good questions lead to better decisions. Um, turn to uh, Psalm chapter 90. Psalm chapter number 90. But you know what? That guy there, I think he asked himself, one of these questions, which is, what does the future hold? What's going to happen to me if I go and I, I, I attack these guys, right? It's like, you know, people need to realize, like, we're not there to fight. We're, you, you think we, we, we bring these invitations in, in the Bible, and we map these areas out, and we pray because we wanna, we're looking for street fights? Like we're trying to put something on World Star? Right, like this is some kind of a pay-per-view, you know, Baptist beefs, which maybe we'll make that. I mean, I don't know, but, you know, we, we, we do have the right to defend ourselves, too. 
And people need to realize that. If you're, if you're going to try to harm me, well, you know what? Unfortunately for you, I'm going to have to defend myself. You know? And that goes for anybody in here. Right. Hopefully it never comes to that. But, I, you know, it's just people around here are just straight up Captain Karens, man. <laughs> you know, I, I was telling some of you, I watched this video of the worst places to live in Boise because I'm trying to get to the best places for soul winning, right? <laughs> and they're like, well, there's no real gangs and there's not a lot of crime. And, you know, here's kind of a poor area and, and this and that. They're like, but one thing that the Treasure Valley does have is Karens. And this was like before the coronavirus thing. And I'm like, whoa, this video was like two years ago. And I was like, that is so true. People here, I mean, they're so bent on their rights. And like, I'm all about having rights, you know, but they just start to make them up. Like, I have the right for you to never knock on my door. I have the right for you to like, ne- I have the right to beat you up for knocking on my door, inviting me to church, which is such a horrible thing, right? That I'm, I'm just, I have the right to just, just knock you out and just, just, just destroy you. Is people have this mindset. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, you go to California, you got to deal with, you know, the gangbangers, which, whatever, a lot of them wind up getting saved, or they're just like, oh, no thanks. But here, I don't know. I'd rather deal with the Crips and Bloods than the Karens. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why I'm talking about this, but Psalm 90, look at verse 8. Let's go to point number 3. Psalm 90, verse 8. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. That should be a very sobering verse to all of us and something that we need, we need to remember and that we need to consider. What is the psalmist saying here? Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. You know what that means? That means our private decisions, this is point number three, our private decisions have public manifestations. See, a lot of times we think, you know what, I'm just going to decide to do this little thing over here. Nobody's looking, nobody else knows, and a lot of times that's true. But you have to realize, what you have to understand, and what hopefully will help us to make better decisions, is you know what, in the light of God's countenance, of who He is, it's made public. It is manifested. Man, you know, that's a tough one. I mean, think about this. You guys know at the end of 2 Samuel, David, King David, a man after God's own heart, but still human. He decides, you know what? I'm going to number Israel. Now, was that a sin? Absolutely. Right? God did not want them to do that because then they could say, well, you know what? We won these battles and we gained, we gained these victories because of our strength. Right? When God was supposed to be manifested, God was supposed to be the one that was put up on high, regarding battle victories, war victories, and so on and so forth. Right? So David says, you know what? I'm going to make a private decision here. I'm going to get Joab and just, hey, just go number the armies of Israel. Well, guess what happened? Chastisement. And so what we need to understand is, you know what? The decisions that a lot of times we make in private that we think that nobody else understands, that nobody else knows, you know what? It affects other people. Or at least you got to understand it has the potential to affect other people. When people make the decision to come here for, for week after week and month after month and get involved, right? And then all of a sudden you never see them again. You know what? That affects people. And they think, well, you know what? I'm just going to kind of quietly bow out. We love them and we want them to come back. And hopefully they do, right? But you know what? That affects people here because it's a joyous thing to see Christians come here and to get on fire, right? I mean, I mean that, that is great because now, now guess what? We, that's more doors that we can knock. That's more edification. That's more everything. That's more for the kingdom of God. That's more that our vision can be fulfilled. But when they dip and they just leave, it's like, man, you know, I wonder if they realize, you know, that secret decision or that so-called secret decision is manifest before God, but it affects all of us. Now, go to Genesis chapter 13. We're almost finished, but Genesis chapter number 13. Now, I'll show you this concept here with Lot in Genesis chapter 13. In Genesis 13, Lot is faced with a decision to make. And it seems kind of like, you know, not a lot of people around. It's not like something they're going to broadcast to the entire world. But there's some beef going on between the herdsmen of Abraham and and, and Lot's uh, herdsmen here. And I want you to look at this here in verse number 8. It says this, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we are brethren. Now, how's that for wisdom? Verse 9, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now, here's the situation. 
Lot is now given an opportunity here. He is literally in the valley of decision. He can go to the left. He can go to the right. He's got options here. Does he react or does he act? That's what you need to ask yourself as you read this next verse. Look at verse 10. And Lot lift up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So what is Lot doing here? He's faced with a decision. One's easy and one seems hard, right? Because he looks to the well-watered plains of Jordan. So, wow, that's pleasing to the eyes. You know, and that becomes the easy decision to make. And then guess what? Does he, does he use any kind of discipline? No, right? He violates point number two, which is what? Discipline versus regret. I mean, if you make decisions with no discipline, guess what? You could possibly live a life of regret. You say, if I had only. Keep reading. Look at verse 11. Then Lot chose them all the plain of Jordan, and, the, and Lot journeyed east, and, he separ and they separated themselves one from the other. So this was a quick decision that he made here. He just was faced with a decision, said, we go there, that doesn't look as good. I'm not going to research that. That looks great over there. Plus, they got, you know, the Vegas city lights and all the, the games and stuff going on, right? He said, I'm, I'm just going to go there. And he makes this decision very quickly, very, very quickly. He doesn't decide to choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. What happens in chapter 14? He's dwelling in Sodom. He gets captured in war with the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, and, and all the queers over there. Think about that, right? He pitched his tent towards Sodom, and then the next thing you know, that decision led to regret. And that decision didn't just affect Lot. It affected Abram because now Abram's got to muster up his men and go rescue him and put their lives into danger. But guess what else? He doesn't learn his lesson, does he? Lot goes back and dwells in Sodom. Yep. And then what happens? I mean, he finds a wife who becomes a pillar of salt. Right? And then what happens after that? What's even worse? <laughs> His daughters. Yeah. Ammon, Moab. And you know the story there? His own daughters get him so drunk that they commit an act of incest. Yeah. Yeah. So his decision in chapter 13 which was seemingly private, right? Because God's, the, the, whole, the narrative of the Bible, the Holy Ghost, is basically giving us the conversation that Lot had with himself. And that decision that he made in the privacy of his own heart was manifest in public. And in 2021, in January, we're reading about it. And thank God we have this information available because it says so much. The decisions that you and I make privately, a lot of times can impact other people. And so we need to realize it and think about that. And that's why I said good decisions result, I mean, I'm sorry, good questions result in better decisions, which in turn fulfills the goal of the sermon to live a life with better memories. Minimize that, the, the pain of regret, right? That's the idea here. Now go to Psalm chapter number 25. Psalm chapter number 25. His, I mean, think about this too. His decision actually brought angels into conflict. <laughs> think about that. Because these queers surround Lot's house. Say, hey, bring these guys out here so we can get to know them. It's like you literally, I mean, obviously the angels are stronger and they're not going to let any of this happen, but he literally, if, if you think about it, put them in danger. Because he doesn't know at this time who they really are. He doesn't completely understand. He doesn't completely get it. And so we need to realize that the decisions that we make in private, right, they can have a public manifestation and they affect other people. You know, and again, David's another good example of this with his private decision to walk around at night on the rooftop and look at Bathsheba and go inquire for her. That followed him around for the rest of his life. And you don't think that David didn't say, you know what, if I had only gone to war, if I had only just turned the other way and just didn't look. One decision literally altered the entire course of, of, of his life. That's it. It just takes one. It just takes one. And this is why we need to master the small decisions. You know, when you get up in the morning, it's like, should I make my bed or no? Do the hard thing, man. And, and, and it's an opportunity for you to practice some discipline and just make that thing. 
You know, you see something on the floor that doesn't belong there, pick that thing up. Yeah. Exercise, discipline, and that will transfer to the bigger decisions that you have to make in your life. Psalm 25, look at verse number 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. So what kind of a person actually fears the Lord? This is what we need to realize. This is what we need to consider. Because that person, God teaches you the right decision to make in your life. That's what this means here. Look at verse 13. His soul shall dwell at ease and his seed shall inherit the earth. I want you to realize, you know, we all, as a church, we want our souls to dwell at ease, don't we? We, 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 we want to be at peace with the decisions that we make. The only way for you, as God's child, to have that peace is really verse number 12. What man is he that shall fear the Lord? Again, it always goes back to those questions. What does the Bible say? What do the wise say? And how does this impact the future? How does this impact other people? Look at verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Say, I want to get better at soul winning. I want to get better at explaining these things. Well, you know what? It's a secret. You can buy all the self-help books you want. You can watch all the motivational speeches that you want. Guess what? The secret of the Lord is with those that fear him. That is the application here. That is what we have to understand. Now go to Proverbs 27. Just two more places to turn and we're done. We're going to wrap this thing up here. So again, the bottom line, point number one, is the right decisions are often the hardest decisions to make. And number two is choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. Maybe that should be the bottom line. Choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. And number three is our private decisions have public manifestations. Now, Proverbs 27, 12. This is the verse on the bulletin. This is something that I think we should all have memorized. This is something that we all need to do. If you can't remember anything else, I mean, have this verse hidden inside of your heart because you need to run every decision that you make through this verse here. Look what it says. A prudent man foreseeth the evil. What's a prudent person? That's right. It's somebody who looks well to their going. It's somebody who considers what does the Bible say? What do the wise say? And how does this impact the future? And how about question number four? How does this impact? How could this impact other people? Right? So a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. Right? The prudent person puts his ear to the ground and says, you know what? I hear footsteps marching. <laughs> it sounds like thousands of people are coming. You know what? I'm just going to hide and see what happens. <laughs> you know, whereas the fool says it's a rock band. It's the, it's the noise of victory. It's nothing to wor worry about. CNN said it's all good. MSNBC said it's all good. Biden's going to take care of us. He loves us. Commies love you. Right? That's the, yeah, that's right. That's the way of the world. But guess what? Look at the rest of the verse. But the simple pass on and are destroyed. You see, the simple. The simple are the unwise. People that are... Basically, a simple person is somebody who just believes everything, except for the truth. You all know simple people. You can tell them anything, right? Hey, did you know Trump killed millions of people in Boise? Yes, I do. <laughs> and, and by the way, the, you know how we tell you people, you guys, these stories? You know, some, somebody I, I would say, well, you know, you, you're picking on people. No. Look, these people aren't intellectually stupid. The, both women that have told me that in this, this, this month that Trump has killed millions of people in the Treasure Valley and in Idaho, they live in houses that are bigger than this entire complex. So obviously they're doing something right financially. Right? But never look at those people and think, well, they've got it all put together. They're smart because they're, guess what? They're stupid. They're simple. Yep. And those are the types of people that you're going to see die first right. when real evil comes to this country. Right. Because they're not prudent. They can't look well to their going. They can't discern the, t the, the, the signs of the times. What happened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees by and large? After the Romans conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD, what happened to them? They got destroyed. Because that's what this verse is saying here, but the simple pass on and are punished. They wanted to hold on to their patriotism. They wanted to hold on to that old system. They wanted to hold on to that Messiah that they conjured up in their own mind that was going to save them physically and establish another sovereign nation of Israel that would once again rule the world. And guess what happened? They all died. And you know what? They're trying the same thing today. They're doing the same exact thing today. So a prudent man foreseeth the evil. 
evil means hurt in the Bible. You know, I'm not against getting news. We need to kind of understand what's going on in today's day and age. Right? We, we, we need to be able to foresee evil and kind of study the times and the things that are being passed and the laws that are being considered. You know, when I hear about one of the, some of these po politicians, like, like that Senator Pan, you know, trying to um, just basically destroy humanity. And you hear the things that come out of their mouths and the things that they want to pass and they want to happen on humanity. You know what? We need to foresee those things and kind of consider them and stop and say, what does the Bible say? Well, you know what the Bible says? That that attitude will be prevalent in the end times. Because now we can hide ourselves. Now I know that when all these celebrities and all these politicians are on TV taking that vaccine, it's like, wait a second. That's evil. How is a cocktail of poisons going to save me? Right? I mean, I mean, think about it. But you know what? The simple pass on and they're punished. The simple say, you know what? I don't want anything to do with Shield of Faith Baptist Church and their message of salvation. I, I believe that my works, I believe that my good deeds are going to save me, and that's all there is to it. You know what? You're going to get punished for eternity for that. You will live eternity in regret because of that decision that you made. And so we need to be prudent. A prudent man foreseeth the evil. Now, uh, go to, keep your place there in Proverbs, because we're going to come back to it. But one more thing. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm chapter number 19. So the prudent foresee the evil and the simple pass on and are punished. Psalm chapter 19, look at verse 8. It says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. This is key. This is paramount here. This is very important for us to understand prudence. The statutes of the Lord are right. What does the Bible say about this issue that I am faced with? What does the Bible say that people would be like in the end times? What does the Bible say that the times would be like before Christ comes back, before the tribulation starts? We need to understand these things and say, hey, there is evil coming. Let's hide ourselves. Let's, let's change things up a little bit, right? Because if we get taken out of the way, who's going to preach the gospel? Nobody, right? But the statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart, that's how you live without regrets. Now look at the rest of the verse. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. MSNBC and CNN are not pure, and they do not enlighten the eyes. And you know what? The same is for Fox News, by the way. Okay, I, don't, I always forget Fox, but you know, God's been sending me to all the CNN homes lately. You know, and I'm, I'm starting to see their mindset of people. And I'm getting to actually visually see the sorcery that's taking place in this country. And it is amazing. It is crazy how this thing works. But go to uh, Proverbs 3, and we are done. We're going to wrap this up here. And so again, better decisions equals better memories. That's what you need to remember. That's the, that's the title of the sermon because that kind of encompasses everything that I've talked about. When we learn to make better decisions, guess what? We're not going to have the regrets. We're not going to have the remorse. We're not going to have that pain. You know, the Bible says the simple pass on because the simple always choose the simple route, right? They don't understand discipline a lot of times. And so guess what? What does that lead? It leads to destruction every single time. Destruction. Now, these verses here in Proverbs 3, you probably learned, you, I bet you already know which ones we're going to read, but you know what? It's for a reason. It's for a purpose. These verses here will save your life. I'm talking physically. I'm talking every decision that you make. You know, if you make it based off of this here, guess what? You're not going to make very many bad decisions. Look at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Amen. This is not simple. This is hard. This is a hard thing to do, and you have to realize that because in life, a lot of times things seem to be correct. You know, they seem to be right. It seems like, man, it seems like I should make this decision right here. This seems like the obvious choice because this would make me happy, and this would make other people happy, and we just always want to be happy. But you know what? Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, not with part of it, not with some of it. Look at verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That is your decisions. That is the way that you walk. But what does it say there? In all thy ways. That means everything that you do. You need to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. You get two hours of sleep, like I, saw, like I talked about earlier, right? Trust in the Lord. Now, obviously, if you've got a long drive, you know, and it's, I, look, common sense, too, right? Which is obviously lacking today. Make the right decision. You know, and I'll just also say this. You know, it's been cold out. 
you know, you ladies with, with young kids and so I get it. <laughs> okay, so I'm not I'm not after you. I get it. I understand that. But in all of our ways, we need to acknowledge him. Before you go to work, before you wake up and homeschool your kids, before you do whatever that you have to do, that's your way. You need to acknowledge him. Pray constantly without ceasing. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. This is the key to living life with fewer regrets. Verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. When you make the decision in your life to depart from evil, by and large, you know what? You're going to make the right choices. Verse 8. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. See, this is, I'm not just talking physically here. You see, I want to live, you know, as long as God would have me to live. And, and, and healthy. I mean, the navel, like, that's like the, the center of your physical body. You know what I mean? Like, like that's, that's your core, your, your, your gut, and all that, all that health inside there. What, what causes that to be healthy? The decisions that you make. You know, when you live a life of regret and you feel that pain in your stomach, that if I had only, that destroys your physical health. And doctors have been trying to figure this out for centuries. Physicians of no value have been studying this and spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to try to come up with solutions and pills and potions to real health. But God says, hey, in all your ways acknowledge me and I will direct your paths. I will help you to make better decisions, which will give you better memories, which will cause less regret, less remorse, which will what? Cause better production in your life, better production for the kingdom of God, and you know what? That's the way that it should be, and it's going to cause you to be physically healthier. Marrow to thy bones. You want your bones to be fat? You don't have to inject yourself, guys, with D, or, 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 not D-ball, Tren. I think you inject Tren, you know, these steroids. Right? I, I'm going to get big. I'm going to I'm, I'm take care of my bones my way. Right? That's the easy way, to ram a needle in your leg. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I bring this up a lot because I've seen it so much. I know so many people that have done this stuff. And it's the easy way. But you know what? They always pay for it in the end. And God says, hey, I can take care of your bones. I can take care of your navel. I can take care of your heart. I can take care of your physical health if you will acknowledge me. Because you know what? He's going to cause you to make the right decision. Because when you fear the Lord and you trust in him with all your heart, you're going to say, what does the Bible say? What do the wise that consider the Bible say? And then you know what? You're going to be prudent and look for the evil that could possibly hurt you or other people. And you're going to say, you know what? This is the decision that I'm going to make. And that's going to build discipline in you. We're going to make better decisions as a church, and we're going to grow, and we're going to conquer this valley. And you know what? We'll do great exploits because things don't seem to be getting any easier, do they? The enemy's coming, and we need to be strong, and we need strong people to be inside of these churches. Because if we don't go out and preach the gospel, honestly, I don't know who will. I really don't. I don't. And, and, and you know, I've ran into other soul winners, you know, in, in Sacramento, in Vancouver, in uh, Tacoma, Seattle, from other Baptist churches or old IFB. I've never run into them here. Never. I'm not saying they haven't been out there. I'm not saying we're the only church that's right on the gospel. You know, there's other churches that, that believe the right gospel, and we talk to them sometimes, but they don't believe in soul winning. How's that decision going to go? You want to talk about a life of regrets? How about an eternity of regrets? Consider that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you again, Lord, for the wisdom that you bring to us week after week, Lord. And just pray that uh, you would help every single person in this church, Lord, to, to understand that we need to choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret and to make the right decisions every single day, Lord. And just please help us to, to remember these things as we go throughout the week and through our lives, Lord, that we might grow and do everything to please you and further your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.